Hi right, all, this uh, welcome to our next uh, thes present uh, thesis defense. This is his PhD thesis defense. It's a public event, so uh, I'm very happy to see all of you here. Um, thankful for the committee and also the family and friends. So Anes has been here from 2018. Um, he was my second PhD student and he did so much work. Um, it's kind of, um, it's very sad for me to let him go, but uh, he has a really great offer. So I'm very thankful that he's, he's getting what he wanted. So Anes, without saying much, you know, this is your day. Go ahead and talk about everything you did during PhD. Thank Thanks. you so much, Sanjay. And uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my thesis defense. I'm Anesh Pratakura. Today, I'm going to defend my thesis, which is on the design of regenerative stormwater biofilters for long-term removal of legacy as well as emerging pollutants. So firstly, a little background about me. I did my bachelor's in India in civil engineering in, from Vets Villani and when I graduated in 2016. Then in 2018, I came to UCLA to do my master's. And then in 2019, I got got my master's and then I moved on to PhD. And during my PhD, I published 13 articles and five of them of them were as first author. In addition to that, I got three, three scholarships from EIF, UConn, and ESCSF. So how I got interested in um, stormwater capture was because I wanted to uh, combat water scarcity or the water crisis is occurring in many urban areas. So these pictures are from my home city of Guwahati where during the every year during the monsoon season, we have all the streets get flooded due to rainfall during the rainfall season. And at the same, as you can see, people have to wade through knee deep water during the roads, which can be just very dangerous due to electrocution or many other crises, many other dangers. And as you can see, the houses and the cars all get submerged. But at the same time, there is no drinking water for the people too. So this, the, as you can see, as the quote goes, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. That's the whole thing that's actually working, going on in, in the urban area. So why does it happen? It's because of the creation of impervious surfaces on the road. So if you look at the image to the right, as you can see in a rural area, normally where there's uh, not much paved surfaces, when it rains, the, some of the water infiltrates into the groundwater and most of and the rest of it goes through as runoff. But as there's more impervious surfaces such as roads and concrete, if they get constructed, the infiltration into the groundwater gets reduced. And, more all, and most all of the water goes as runoff. So this runoff is what causes the urban floods. And due to this uh, infil less infiltration of water, the groundwater is not getting recharged. And due to this, since groundwater is a major drinking water source, people don't have water to drink. So what is the solution to this? Is stormwater biofilters, which capture and also treat stormwater. So stormwater biofilters are low impact development projects where they're constructed in designated areas where stormwater runoff collects and this the media in the biofilter media, which is showing out here, they have high hydraulic conductivity so the water can rapidly pass through and recharge the groundwater or can collect it somewhere. And, then, and in addition to that, they also have certain amendments such as compost or bio, biochar, which removes any pollutant that's are in the storm water. So how they remove it is by, firstly, in the short term, while the water is infiltrating through it, the, by, they absorb the pollutants. And in the long term, the microbiome in the biofilter, they uh, degrade these pollutants by metabolism or co-metabolism. That's the best case, you know, that's, a, uh, that's the uh, very good, uh, the what we expect from biofilters but in reality not all, all pollutants especially the emerging pollutants not they are not biodegradable so what happens in this case is that so as the pollutant stormwater with non-biodegradable pollutants enter the stormwater biofilter first they get absorbed and they stay in the stormwater and get absorbed in the biofilter media but as more and more rainfall occurs and more and more pollutants get absorbed in the biofilter media they start accumulating and this accumulating exhaust all the absorption sites in the biofilter. In the biofilter, and due to this exhaustion, there can be no more absorption of these pollutants in the biofilter media. And so, whichever whatever is going in is coming outside. So, in this case, now you can say that whole the whole biofilter has failed. Now you have to excavate the whole biofilter media and remake it. So this is a very costly procedure, which can which is not in, is not practical. So my solution is. In situ, we add some chemicals to the biofilter media to regenerate this ex exhausted absorption site. So this is the topic of my thesis. So I'll break down my thesis, which I've broken down into uh, four chapters. The first three chapters 
are mostly on PFAS and emerging pollutant. The first two chapters, I study how PFAS moves to the sur surface. Uh, in the first chapter, in, the cha in chapter three, I see in saturated conditions, how small fluctuations in the flow, in the flow of water can affect the transport of PFAS to the subsurface. And in the fourth chapter, I see how weathering cycles, such as dry wet or free thaw cycles, affect this transport of PFAS as well. And using these two studies, I go to biofilters and I try to develop a way to make, uh, to make uh, regenerative biofilters for PFAS removal using cationic polymers. After, and after these three chapters, I go to more legacy pollutants such as pathogen and heavy metals. And I see how these two interactions, we can take advantage of these two these interactions between pathogen and heavy metals to make the biofilters naturally regenerate their pathogen removal capacity. So, for, okay, coming to the first chapter, first three chapters is the transport of PFAS to the environment. So, why is that? Is that we started to work on PFAS. It's because it's an emerging com contaminant, which is a very big concern nowadays because PFAS was widely used in various applications such as non stick cookware, packaging material, and firefighting purposes due to its highly stable nature, the highly stable nature of carbon flow in bond. So, but what the disadvantage of this highly stable nature was that it's non-biodegradable. So when we are when we are exposed to it, it accumulates in our body and it causes very a lot of diseases such as kidney cancer, high blood pressure, and birth defects. So how do how are we exposed to PFAS? Suppose consider this if this uh, PFAS contaminated site, how it enters our drinking water supply is through runoff and to subsurface. So suppose it's raining. This is a PFAS contaminant site and there's, rains, there, there's a rainfall event out there. So the water will mix with the PFAS and con the, this will contaminate the rainwater. And this contaminated rainwater will either pass through the subsurface or will go off as runoff through the, on, on the ground. This in infiltration of this runoff in this PFAS contaminated rainwater will contaminate the groundwater while the runoff will again contaminate the surface water. So this is why we need to create stormwater biofilters which can not only remove PFAS, but also since PFAS is a non biodegradable compound, it will accumulate in the biofilters. So if we need to create biofilters that can regenerate their PFAS removal capacity. So to study that, I first went on to the uh, transport of PFAS to the subsurface. I particularly concentrated on the colloid facilitated transport of, of PFAS in the subsurface. Why is that so? Because that was a very uh, not very looked at in previous studies. So normally what people consider is that when water is, when PFAS is flowing with water, the major mode of transport of PFAS is the <clears throat> adductive force of water or diffusion of P PFAS, the diffusion of forces of PFAS. So, and wh while the soil or any so solids, the, they serve as a sink of, sink of PFAS, while, so they absorb PFAS, which prevents the further transport to drinking water sources. But, it's, uh, the surface water or any water also contain tiny colloids in, or suspended particles in, the, in their water. And since PFAS uh, can absorb to these colloids, these absorbed PFAS, these colloids can serve as a transport mechanism in the surface water. We, this is a transport mechanism which, has not, which had not been considered in previous studies. So to find evidence of this, I looked into literature. So this evidence of literature was, is in my chapter two. And what I saw was that I looked at PFAS concentration in suspended sediments as well as bed sediments in surface waters and saw that the PFAS concentration in suspended sediments is much, much higher than the bed sediments irrespective of the carbon chain length. So as you can see in these two graphs, these in the y-axis in the log axis. So this one, two, three is the order of magnitudes. So you can see that irrespective of the carbon chain length, the suspended sediments can contain contain at least one or more, at least or even more than two order of magnitude and amount of PF, concentration of PFAS compared to bed sediments. So and so since this particle are mobile with the surface water, this this shows that we have a high exposure risk of PFAS from this colloids with the transport of PFAS. Not only in air, water, even in air, like dust particles in the air can also contain PFAS. So this another study which I saw was that the tiny tiny dust particles, even though PFAS is non-volatile, tiny tiny dust particles can absorb PFAS and they can transport the PFAS through the air and we can inhale it. So there's an inhalation exposure as well, which has not been considered. 
but in, I show that this colloid concentration of PFAS does concern, is very comparable to other organic compounds that are present in different other studies. So this shows that this colloid facilitated transport of PFAS is not only a big concern in surface water or in, this, or in surface water, but also in air. So that's why I decided to concentrate on this colloid facilitated transport of PFAS in the subsurface. In, uh, now this brings me to chapter three, how where the small fluctuations in the flow of water can affect the transport of PFAS, uh, can affect the transport of PFAS. So I published a paper on this in environmental pollution. So the whole concept behind this is that when there's, uh, when suppose there's a, this is the stormwater biofilter and there's rainfall occurring on the biofilter. This, this rate of infiltration of water is not constant. And this, due to this, this, uh, so uh, due to this, this um, infiltration, this change in infiltration rate can exert a shear force on the walls of the soil, on the walls of the, walls of the biofilter media. So this uh, shear force can release colloids into the bio, uh, from the biofilter media. And if this biofilter media has adsorbed PFAS, since these colloids came from the biofilter media, this these colloids will also release PFAS into the pore water. So to find evidence of this, I packed soil columns, uh, uh, packed uh, polypropylene columns with soil, and then injected uh, groundwater spiked with PFAS in, into these columns. And then <clears throat> up till breakthrough. Breakthrough is when the influent, the effluent concentration that is coming up from the top is equal to the influent concentration that we are injecting. During breakthrough, we know that when it has break, we know that all the PFAS absorption sites in the in the columns have been exhausted. There will be no more PFAS absorption by the soil. So after breakthrough, I stop the flow into the by, in, into the columns. So now I let the and, and I let the uh, what the PFAS in the pore water equilibrate with the soil with the soil in the in the columns. So. In, in initially, when I didn't consider the colloid facilitated transport of PFAS, we thought that since the pore water is a higher concentration of PFAS the, than the soil, then the PFAS will diffuse into the so from the pore water into the soil, and this will cause a do drop in the concentration of PFAS. So when we restart the flow, the PFAS concentration should drop down. But what we actually observed was a rise in PFAS concentration. Both, sorry. Both the long short chain PFAS, which is PFBA, and long chain PFAS, this is, that is PFOA, both of their concentration increase after the flow interruption. So we were confused. Why did that happen? So we decided to check the liquid samples, check the water samples. We check, decided to check the observed the water samples under electron microscopy. So I dried the water samples and in a vacuum oven, and then I observed it, both the uh, water effluent samples before and after the flow interruptions in a electron microscope, scanning electron microscope. And I saw that after the flow interruption, there were a lot of colloids in the liquid sample. And due to this, uh, when I removed the colloids, the PFAS concentration actually dropped down. And as you can see, the, this drop down in the PFAS concentration was higher for PFOA than PFBA. Now, so this showed that these colloids could have absorbed PFAS. And, and PF, since PFOA has a higher affinity to absorption, this con that's why the, drop, the particle, particle concentration of PFOA was higher than PFOA. So this gave evidence that the colloids, that the flow interaction was releasing colloids into the um, pore water. And then the, since this, and this colloids actually increased the PFAS concentration in the pore water. So key takeaways from this project, flow interruption and, uh, and fluctuation in flow can release colloids from the soil into the pool water, which can also contain absorbed PFAS. The implication for this in biofilter design is that since pore water keeps fluctuating in the biofilter media, there's a high possibility that PFAS could be released from the biofilter media into the pore water and can contaminate the ground, contaminate the ground. So next I went on to more complicated. I went to see how other weathering cycles such as dry wet cycles and freeze thaw cycles affect the transport of PFAS in the subsurface. Right. Okay, so I published a paper on this in the Journal of Hazardous Materials Letters. And the whole concept of dry wet cycle and freeze cycle is that dry wet cycle is basically when there's rainfall and be two, between two periods of rainfall, there's a time when there's no infiltration of water through the biofilter. And this causes an air water interface to develop in the biofilter media. 
this and previous studies have shown that both PFAS and colloids are attracted to this air water interface due to hydrophobic interactions. So when there's an air water interface developing in there, this attraction can dissolve, absorb PFAS from the biofilter media from the soil. And it can this and, and this can release the absorbed PFAS into the pore water. And when there's another the next in the next infiltration event, this dissolved PFAS can be flushed down to the ground to the groundwater. In the case of freeze cycles, the unique property of water is that when it freezes, it expands. So due to this expansion, it can cross add pressure to the uh, soil or the biofilter media, which can cause tiny cracks to form in this. And these tiny cracks can release colloids from the uh, from the biofilter media or the soil into the pore water. And in, when the, at, at the next thawing process, in thawing uh, process, uh, event, this infiltration of water will flush out all these colloid associated PFAS into the pore water, into the groundwater. So to test this um, uh, hypothesis, again, I took the six columns. And then I firstly, I flood using just uncontaminated groundwater, I flushed out all the water that is present in, in the, all the PFAS that is present in the pore water uh, outside. I flushed out, flushed it out. So that only the only PFAS that remains in the soil columns that were, were the ones that were absorbed with the soil columns. So any increase or decrease in PFAS concentration with the leaching test will be because of the release of PFAS from the soil and not from the pore water. So after I flushed out all the PFAS in the pore water, I flipped the columns upside down and I started to, in, I injected uh, what, groundwater for the leaching test from the top to better simulate subsurface flow conditions. And then I split the columns into two sets of three columns. And one, the yellow one was the control column where I just infiltrated groundwater. And the, in the blue one, I subject them to leaching tests. What were the leaching tests were? First, I subjected them to dry weight cycle, and then I to freeze thaw cycle. So dry weight cycles, basically, I stopped the flow, and then I let the columns drain for 45 hours, and then I restarted the flow. This, this process was repeated three times, and to get uh, and eat, and eat, after each cycle, I injected two pore volume of uncontaminated groundwater. Similarly, for freeze thaw cycles, I stopped the flow and kept the columns in a freezer at minus 15 degrees Celsius to let the pore water freeze. And then I restarted, then I took them out after 24 hours and let it melt, let the water melt. And then again, after 21 hours, I restarted flow. Again, three, three cycles and two pore volume uncontaminated groundwater in each cycle. So this showed, and then when I measured the effluent samples for PFAS concentrations from both the control and the uh, leaching the column subjected to leaching experiment, I saw that the both the dry weight and the freeze thaw cycles release considerably more PFAS than the control columns. And due to this, this uh, increase in PFAS concentration, uh, we could see, see that the dry weight cycle and the freeze thaw cycle were actually releasing PFAS from the soil into the pore water. In addition to PFAS, they were also releasing multiple um, high amounts of colloids into the pore water. And when similarly as the previous chapter, if you remove these colloids, we see that the, the PFAS concentration actually decreases. So these colloids also contain absorbed PFAS. So finally, key takeaways from this is that both dry weight cycles can, and free source cycles can release PFAS from the soil into the pore water and also release colloids, colloids and colloid associated PFAS into the pore water. And the implication is that all biofilters are continuously exposed to these dry wet and free thaw cycles. And we should consider this effect of dry wet free thaw cycle leaching of PFAS while designing biofilters. So finally, when I, uh, in my fifth chapter, I used all these studies to develop a way to create regenerative biofilters using cationic polymers. So I'm writing a paper on this, which should be uh, submitted shortly. So the basic concept behind this is that Suppose uh, you have a, a, a biofilter media which has uh, its absorption sites exhausted by PFAS. So in this condition, suppose you consider the one on the right. They, the, all of the absorption sites in the biofilter media uh, in, this, in this area on the right are exhausted by PFAS. There won't be any more absorption of PFAS, firstly, because they, all the absorption sites are exhausted. And secondly, because the, since PFAS is negatively charged as well, it will increase the negative charge on the biofilter media or on the soil. And this will uh, repel any other PFAS that is entering through the pore water. In, on, in contrast, if you have a cationic polymer coating it, 
not only will it increase the uh, will add new absorption sites, but the positive charge on this cationic polymers will attract the negatively charged PFAS. So we are not only replenish the, replenishing the absorption sites, but also increasing the PFAS absorption. So to test this hypothesis, I packed six columns of uh, biofilter media, which is 70% sand and 30% compost. And then I divided them again into two sets. In one set, which is the yellow one, I was where my controls, and the other set, the blue one, where my PFAS EDAD my columns. So in, in both the sets, I first injected PFAS contaminated storm water until breakthrough, so that all the PFAS absorption sites were exhausted. And then the after exhaustion in the control columns, I just injected synthetic storm water, while in the PDADMAC columns, I injected PDADMAC solution to replenish the absorption sites. And then after PDADMAC breakthrough, I inje again injected PFAS. And then I checked what I measured the PFAS concentration in the effluents after this PDADMAC injection. And I, went, and I saw that this injection of PDADMAC actually improved not only replenish the PFAS absorption site, but also re improve the PFAS ab absorption by the biofilter media. Now, for, a, for all the PFAS, from, sh from short chain PFAS to long chain PFAS, PF, up till PFDE. So as you can see, although we may think that the, high, the removal was higher for the long chain PFAS, but if you look at the short chain PFAS, if you see the beneficial effect of PDMAC addition was more for the short chain PFAS. Why is that? Because PFO and PFDA, they're already being removed by the compost in the biofilter by hydrophobic interactions. But hydrophobic interactions are not that major for short chain PFAS because of the short chain. So this electrostatic interactions, attraction provided by the PDMAC is more beneficial for short chain PFAS. And when I plotted this increase in removal due to increase in PFAS removal due to PDMAC addition with the increase in carbon chain length, there's a decreasing trend. So the highest increase was for PMBA, the lowest was for PMBA. So this showed that, that inject in the injection of PDADMAC is much more beneficial for the short, removal of short chain PFAS compounds. In addition to that, what we had this assumption that since PDADMAC is a coagulant, it is used for drinking water treatment, we thought that one detrimental effect of adding PDATMAC was that it will clog the suspended particles present in storm water. And it, this clogging, and it will, since it will flocculate them together this, and settle them down, this will clog the biofilter media. But when we observe, when it expose both the control and the PDATMAC columns to increase amount of solids loading, the solids were tiny particles of less than 75 micron size. We saw that actually the decrease in the hydraulic conductivity due to the solids loading was more for the control columns than for the PDMAC columns. So this showed that PDMAC coating was actually beneficial for the PDM for our biofilters, as they were also preventing this loss in hydraulic conductivity when they suspended particles in the storm water. And also, in finally, one more sorry, one more observation was, was that. The, when we analyze the turbidity of the effluent samples from both the control and the PDADMAC columns, we saw that the turbidity of this biofilter uh, of the effluent samples was much lower for the PDADMAC columns. So this showed that not only was it reducing the hydraulic, um, reducing the rate in reducing uh, of the loss in hydraulic conductivity, it was also reducing the release of colloids from the, from the columns. So as we saw in the previous studies that these colloids can contain associated PFAS onto them, this injection of PDMA was also minimizing the release of colloid associated PFAS from the biofilters. So this, this showed that PDMA injection is very beneficial for our biofilters uh, for firstly for replenishing the PFAS absorption sites, increasing PFAS absorption, for reducing the re loss in hydraulic conductivity due to solids addition, and also reducing the release of colloids. So this showed that PFA injection of PDATMAC is very beneficial and can be implemented in biofilter design. And finally, in my final chapter, I would go to more legacy pollutant, which is pathogen and heavy metals. The basic logic behind that is that our <laughs> storm water does not just contain PFA, one compound such as PFAS or pathogen. It's a whole soup of different, different pollutants such as pathogens, DOC, nutrients, and heavy metals, and a lot of different pollutants. So these pollutants interact between each other, and this interaction can actually affect the removal of, this, of these pollutants by our biofilter media. 
So normally other studies show that only show the detrimental effect. Most understanding only show the detrimental effect of this because they say that suppose for PFAS removal, they show that presence of DOC, DOC or nutrients compete with PFAS for the absorption sites and they reduce this removal of PFAS. But in this study, I'll show that this presence of co-contaminants can actually increase the long-term removal of pathogens by due to the due to the interactions between the uh, pathogens and other pollutants. So I published a paper in the journal Hazana Digital. Is the is the most recent paper that's published just in January 2022. So the basic logic behind this is that it's all related to pathogen and patho the major <laughs> one danger of pathogen. The major danger danger behind pathogen is that it's living. So living things can grow. So it has a higher risk of exhausting the biofilter media. How? So suppose this is a pathogen contaminated stormwater. Is increase and is accumulating in the biofilter media. Now, this accumulated biofilter, it doesn't even need subsequent days of rainfall to increase its concentration. Between two rainfall events, the pathogens can grow in the biofilter media and further exhaust the biofilter media. And this will quickly exhaust the pathogen removal capacity of the biofilter and will lead the biofilter to fail. But in addition to pathogens, stormwater also contains heavy metals. Now these heavy metals are toxic to biofilter, to pathogens, to because they they accumulate in the path, in the in the cells of microorganisms and lead to the death of these cells. So I saw I thought that can these interactions between absorb the heavy metals are absorbed to the biofilter media and to pathogens affect the transport of affect the trans affect the interactions between pathogens and heavy metals. So I hypothesize that since heavy metals are toxic to the pathogens, they will uh, kill the pathogens and then they will mitigate. And this killing of pathogen will reduce the growth of pathogens, the accumulation of pathogens in the biofilter media, which will mit mitigate the exhaustion of biofilter media and also reduce the, re the leaching or remobilization of these absorbed pathogens. Sorry, yeah. So to test this, concept, I packed two columns, six columns of uh, with sand and ESCS, expanded shale clay and slate. And this ESCS is a novel media, which is made by putting clay and slate and shale in a rotary kiln, kiln and then blasting them at a high temperature. This creates lightweight aggregate that are very strong, have a high hydraulic conductivity, and also can remove, has a high ability of remove, removing pollutants because of the highly porous structure. So I packed these six columns and again divided into two sets of aged and unaged biofilters. So the aged biofilters, the only difference between the aged and the unaged bi biofilters is that the aged biofilters were, will be expo were exposed to heavy metals, while the unaged heavy metals were not exposed to heavy metals. So after I saw that after exposing this aged this age ESCS to heavy metals, I saw that these biofilters could remove a lot of heavy metals. So as you can see, even up in this breakthrough curves where it come, even after injection of 500 poor volumes of heavy metal contaminated stormwater, the compared to the in, uh, injected heavy metal concentration, which is shown by the dashed line, the effluent heavy metal concentration was significantly less, both for lead, copper, and even zinc. So as you can, this showed that a lot of heavy metals was absorbed by the ESCS media. How, and then I decided to observe, study the mechanism behind this absorption, and so I, took the ESC, contaminated ESCS media and observed them under FTIR and saw that the peaks corresponding to the hydroxyl radicals were changed due to this absorption of heavy metals. So, and so this showed that the heavy metals were interacting with the hydroxyl radicals in the, bio, in the ESCS media. And due to this, the hydroxyl, the negative zeta potential of the ESCS media, of the age ESCS media was much less negative. So their interaction was more of an electrostatic attraction between the negative hydroxyl radicals and the positively charged heavy metals. So after I knew that the, heavy, the ESCS media could absorb a lot of heavy metals, I decided to see the effect of this heavy metal absorption on E. coli. So I both the columns, I injected about eight pore volumes of E. coli contaminated storm water and after injection, injecting the eight pore volumes, I stopped the flow and let the columns dry out for increasing drying periods for like one, two, four, and seven days. And then after this drying period, I again started injecting storm, uh, E. coli contaminated stormwater. Then I took the E. coli samples and I studied the 
pathogen removal cap the e coli removal capacity and also the e coli release of e coli by during this drying periods so firstly it shows i this is the graph of the path e coli removal capacity of the biofilters with increasing dry periods so as you can see first i will ask you to consider on the unaged media so as you can see in the in the y axis we have the ratio of the effluent e coli concentration which is the c divide and the influent e coli concentration that is c not so as you can see the unaged meat e coli unaged biofilters had uh, their have pathogen removal capacity decrease exponentially so the pet e coli concentration in the effluent samples increased exponentially with the increasing dry periods and after eight periods eight days of dry we see that the e coli concentration in the effluent and the effluent all were same so they, after eight days of dry we could say that the e unaged biofilter media were completely lost their e coli removal capacity and in contrast the aged biofilters which had which were exposed to heavy metals their loss in e coli removal was much more gradual much more logarithmic so due to so as you can see so this showed that this heavy exposure to heavy metals mitigated this loss in e coli removal capacity of the biofilter not only that it also showed that the aged biofilter media also reduce the remobilization of absorbed pathogens from the biofilter now both the unaged and the aged biofilters removed uh, remove uh, reduce the remobilization of pathogens due to uh, with increased drying period but the increase but the this reduction was much low much lower at a lower rate for the unaged biofilters compared to the aged biofilters the decrease for the aged biofilters was more exponential so this showed that it not only just was it increasing the and mitigating the loss in removal capacity of e coli but also reduce reducing the remobilization absorb absorb e coli from the biofilter media so next i decided to study the mechanism how was the aged escs removing more pathogens from the storm water mitigating the loss of pathogen removal capacity of the of the of the biofilters so for that i did some batch experiments where i exposed unaged escs which is in the pink color and is escs to storm water spiked with e coli so as you can see in the pink line we see that the unaged escs when after 7 hours of exposure could only reduce the es the e coli concentration by one order of magnitude in comparison the aged escs completely removed all the uh, pathogen all the e coli in the storm water after just 3 hours of exposure and then but i did another experiment after that was that from the aged escs i try to leach out some of the absorbed heavy metals to reduce the heavy metals that were present in absorbed to the escs media and i took this each uh, this leach heavy metals and, and spiked them and in a different storm in a different test tube which is the green color and and spiked them both with e coli and this after i uh, when i did the same experiment on them i saw that the time required to kill off all the e coli uh, to remove all the e coli i don't know if it's if it was killed yet but to remove all the uh, e coli present in the storm water increased to 5 hours when a lot, some of the heavy metals were leached out in comparison the leached out heavy metals or the dissolved heavy metals present in the storm water did not kill any did not remove any of the e coli so this what we can result from that is that the absorbed es metals in the ESTS media whether whether ones responsible for removing e coli from the storm water and not the one that were leached out from the uh, that were leached out from the ESTS media uh, uh, that were killing off the e coli so right now we we, we did not actually know it was uh, is was it actually killing the e coli or was it because of the less negative zeta potential of the ESTS media due to heavy metal exposure it was it was just increasing the absorption of e coli so to test this hypothesis was it actually killing off the e coli or was it just increasing its absorption i decided to do fluorescence microscopy so i extracted the e coli present in both the unaged escs which were not which didn't have any heavy metals and the aged escs which are the highest amount of heavy metals then so, this extracted pet e coli I exposed them to the backlight live dead analysis now this backlight live dead analysis kit has two dyes the propidium iodide and the cytonine dye the cytonine dye which gives us a green which gives up a green, green fluorescence can coat all bacterial cells irrespective of the viability but the but the propidium iodide dye can only enter cell when its cell membrane is damaged so this they can only enter dead e coli cells 
and give off a red color. So if a color shows red color in fluorescence in a fluorescent microscope, that means it's dead. And if a cell shows green color, it means it's alive. So when I observe both this X, E. coli extracted from the unaged ESCS and the aged ESCS, we see that the unaged ES, the bacterial cells from the unaged ESCS were alive, were still alive, but the aged ESCS, they were more dead cells. So due to this, we can see that the heavy metals exposed to the ESCS media were not only absorbing ES, E. coli, but also killing them off. And this was actually mitigating the loss in pathogen world capacity. So key takeaway from this project was that the ESCS media had could retain significant amount of heavy metals, and this retained heavy metals could absorb, and it can kill the absorb E. coli and mitigate the exhaustion of the biofilter media. So implications, the, these are wide range of implications for this, is that co-contaminants in the in a storm water, we can take advantage of this co-contaminants to increase uh, the, to, to make biofilters naturally regenerate their, bio, their ability to remove pollutants. It can be any pollutant, like a pathogen or anything. You just need to add the correct absorbance as amendments to the biofilter media. For in this case, I use ESCS to absorb a lot of emitters, but we have to make Further studies can use more absorbent, different absorbents for different co-contaminants. So this brings me to my end of my thesis, different in my thesis, and so, so some conclusions. Basic conclusion is that firstly, from the chapter three, we see that fluctuations in groundwater flow can release PFAS contaminated colloids from the soil to the groundwater, and dry wet cycles and freeze thaw cycles can release PFAS and PFAS contaminated colloids from the into the from the subsurface, and to mitigate that, we can actually inject cationic polymers such as speed dead mag into, into the biofilters, which can not only replenish PFAS absorption sites, but also increase PFAS absorption and reduce the release of PFAS containing colloids. Finally, not we, sometimes we, by just taking the advantage of coke contaminants present in the storm water, such as heavy metals, we can make biofilters naturally regenerate their pathogen in one capacity. Recommendation for further studies. So we, in, the, in my study, I saw the effect of PDM injection on biofilter, just the uh, clogging or in PFAS, fate, and fate of PFAS, but biofilter microbiome is an important factor that is required for removal of other pollutants such as DOC or nutrients. And we need to see the effect of PDM injection on the biofilter microbiome because PDM can be toxic to certain microorganisms, which, and if they kill off the microbiome, you're, there will be no degradation of absorbed DOC or nutrients, but also certain microorganisms such as Bacillus subtilis can actually grow in, term, in, term, in presence of PDMAC, and they can actually can they may be able to degrade the PDMAC by acting on the amine group present in PDMAC. So we have to see. So if they can degrade the PDMAC, they, this will cause losses in the PDMAC removal capacity of the biofilter, and can also release the pet, the P, the PFAS that was absorbed by this PDMAC. And another thing that we can observe uh, from this from my last chapter was that although heavy metals can kill off most of the pathogens, certain pathogens can survive in the present heavy metals, which are heavy metal resistant. And by not killing them off, they're selecting for this heavy metal resistant bacteria, which can release heavy metal resistant genes. And heavy metal can also co-select for antibiotic resistant genes. And this can lead to biofilters being a net source of not only heavy metal resistance, but also antibiotic resistant genes, which is a very huge cause of concern in today's work. So this makes me know, and I have a bunch of people to thank for my whole PhD journey. Firstly, of course, my advisor, I know Sanjay don't like me praise, but I'm gonna do it. You're the best advisor I could ever get. Thank you so much. I grew a lot because of you as a researcher, as a writer, and as a presenter, everything was because of you. I would also like to thank our committee members. Thank you, Shaylee. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Eric, for all your guidance. Thank you for everything that you, you have done for me. So I would like to thank all the members of the Seal Lab Committee for helping in my research, for making our lab group the best lab group in all of in UCLA or maybe the whole world, especially Renan for teaching you everything that I learned, everything for doing lab work. I would like to thank all my best friends, Jamie and Vera. They are the bestest friends I could ever get. And they actually made PhD life very much livable. They made me and helped me enjoy PhD life and keep a work-life balance. I would like to thank Tonoi. Without you, I wouldn't have got the postdoc. You know that <laughs> your guidance was as a postdoc was the best thing ever. Finally, I, I'd also like to thank my undergrads. Thank you so much for suffering through me for all the work in the lab that we did together, working in weekends, working in 
the summer, <laughs> all the last minute work. And I would like to thank my parents. My, my parents are here, they probably can't hear me because it's India and the internet is not that good. But thank you, my mom, my dad, and my sister. They supported me throughout this time, even though they were in the other side of the world, but they had, they helped me survive. They supported me even in my lowest time, lowest times. So I'm really in depth to that. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Caltrans, ERF, ESC, SCI, and then I would like to thank UCLA for giving me this opportunity. So what's next? I actually got a postdoc at University of Minnesota in Novak lab and Bill Arnold's lab where we'll use encapsulated pathogens for effective di di digestion of brewery wastewater to generate methane. So that brings you to air and I'll take any questions now. I want to keep that, make sure there is a noise of clapping because we are doing on Zoom. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Sure. I want to make sure that I clap on the on the Zoom. Um, all right, I'm going to start uh, stop recording.